Philadelphia Baseball History presents Memories of Veterans Stadium. Maybe at the statue of the guy sliding in a second. It's what my friends and I often said to each other when we planned to take the subway down to Bard and Patterson to see a Phillies game. The statue was right next to the ticket office, where we might sometimes splurge and ask for the best available seats. Usually, however, we spent our money on the cheap seats in the upper deck. Veterans Stadium opened in 1971, a multi-purpose stadium that seated over 70,000 for baseball and football games. Considered state-of-the-art at the time, it boasted two electronic scoreboards that could make cartoonish faces to represent the players on the field and incite the crowd to cheer after critical plays. AstroTurf served as the playing surface following the trend at the time. The Vet also almost became a dome, as Philadelphia craved the honor of hosting a Super Bowl one day. But Veterans Stadium was meant to be more than just merely a new steel and concrete home for the Phillies and Eagles. It was meant to be an entertainment extravaganza. Bill Giles, who eventually became the president and part owner of the Phillies, was hired in 1970 to fill the seats in a cavernous stadium. The Phillies hired Giles because of his success in Houston in putting together wildly entertaining promotions. The Phillies hoped he could do the same for them. One of Giles' innovations, which he hoped would excite the fans to become more involved in the game, was something called the Home Run Spectacular. And just what was a Home Run Spectacular? Well, that is probably best described by Giles in his own words, which he gave the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1970. When a Philly hits a homer, Philadelphia Phil will appear between the boards in center field and hit a baseball. It will travel toward the message board in right center and strike a Liberty Bell. The bell will glow and its crack will light up. The ball will continue and hit little Philadelphia Phyllis in the fanny and she will fall down. As she falls, she will pull a lanyard on a cannon and the cannon will explode. After smoke and sound effects, a colonial flag will drop down. Then my dancing waters will come into play the tune of Stars and Stripes Forever. Ah, the 70s. A time before blatant sexism was universally considered bad. Indeed, hitting Phyllis in the fanny was not the only chauvinistic feature at baseball at the vet. Enter the Hot Pants Patrol. These were female ushers hired to escort fans to their seats and to wipe the seats down. The Phillies hired attractive young women for this role, outfitting them in the style of the day. Short pants that exposed most of the thigh, called hot pants. Lest you think wearing short pants helped keep the young ladies cool during the hot and humid Philadelphia summers, their uniform included knee-high plastic white boots, boots that were notorious for being sweat-inducing on a hot summer's day. Of course, to be fair, there's not much difference between the Hot Pants Patrol of the early 1970s and Hooters girls stationed on the foul line in Clearwater today, whose main purpose, other than the eye candy, is to retrieve foul balls and to give them to deserving fans, usually adorable children seated nearby. As an aside, the Phillies currently hire young ladies with athletic skills, such as softball experience, to serve as ball girls at Citizens Bank Park. The Phillies hold annual tryouts and advertise that modern ball girls are meant to be role models in professional sports for young girls. But back to the home run spectacular. Unfortunately, this novelty was built on a budget. On the Vets' opening day, April 10, 1971, Phillies third baseman Don Money hit the stadium's first home run. As the spectacular went into motion, the Liberty Bell did not light up, and the smoke from the cannon was delayed for a few minutes after the home run. By the end of the season, the home run spectacular was dismantled due to the obstructed view created for Eagles fans. Giles' flair for promotions, however, reached beyond the home run display in center field. A trip to the vet had the potential to become quite a spectacle. There was the great Walenda, who wowed fans between the games of a doubleheader in 1972. A 67-year-old circus performer, the great Walenda silenced the crowd by walking a tightrope strung across the top of the vet, without a net. And if that were not enough, Walenda performed a headstand in the middle of his feet. Game day attractions included Kite Man, who after several years of failed attempts, finally made it to home plate as promised. Cannon Man shot himself out of a cannon and center field to home plate. The tightrope promotion was repeated by Cycle Man, who rode a motorcycle across the Veteran Stadium sky with a young lady dangling from a swing below the cycle. There were elephants, ostriches, the world's largest kazoo band, when fans were given a kazoo and asked to play Take Me Out to the Ball Game, not to mention the Parachute Man and Rocket Man. 
Of course, Veteran Stadium's greatest attraction was the Philly Fanatic. While the Phillies had the mascot twins of Phil and Phyllis, they failed to ignite the excitement of the hometown fans. So on April 25, 1978, the Phillies unveiled the lovable green-feathered creature who hailed from the Galapagos Islands, the Philly Fanatic. Originally portrayed by intern Dave Raymond, the Fanatic won the hearts of young and old alike with his on-field antics and outgoing childlike nature. The Fanatic may not have been Tommy Lasorda's favorite, but as a kid, I can remember waiting for what seemed like forever just to get a kiss from the Fanatic's snout when he visited a local carnival. The Fanatic's run has been so successful that not only has he spawned knockoffs, but he remains the greatest mascot in all of sports, even after 42 years. Indeed, being a kid growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, Veterans Stadium was the place to be. Initially, you could bring food and beverages into the stadium, so Dad would often fill up a cooler of lemonade, plop down $2 per ticket for the 700-level seats, which he affectionately called the nosebleed section, and take my sister and me, sometimes our cousins, to experience the spectacle that was a Phillies game. Often we went on weekend giveaway days when we would receive a special hat, Phillies batting gloves, a bottle bat, a backpack, a rain jacket, all just for being 14 or younger and coming to the park. We would watch the fanatic dance on top of the dugout, perform with the grounds crew, or just walk through the stadium with an entourage of young kids following him. If we were lucky, we would even see the bull, Greg Lezinski, launch a home run into the upper deck. Eventually, Mom and Dad sprung for lower-level seats, the 200-level, right behind third base. We bought the Sunday season plan, which meant we would watch Mike Schmidt put on a clinic on third base. The concourse behind the 200 level had the better food and souvenir stands. There was also the original Wall of Fame, where the Phillies would honor a player from the past from both the Phillies and the Philadelphia Athletics with a ceremony and a plaque. It was that Wall of Fame that taught me that there had actually been a world championship team that once played in Philadelphia before the Phillies beat Kansas City for their first title in 1980. As a partial season ticket holder, we were eligible to buy World Series tickets in 1980. In fact, had we bought the tickets, they would have been to Game 6, when the Phillies finally won the World Series. However, being a working class family, my parents only had enough money for either the World Series tickets or a trip to the Poconos during Christmas vacation. They presented the choice to my sister and me by emphasizing how the Phillies had choked for three straight years and likely wouldn't even make it past the National League playoffs. So, of course, my sister and I chose the Poconos. All we got from the World Series was a special edition program a friend of ours bought when she attended Game 6. As a teenager, I would bring a friend to the stadium, and we took great pride in our efforts to walk around the 600 and 700 level in order to be part of the wave in as many sections of that as we could. When I came home from the summers while attending college out of state, I recall driving on I-95 with my best friend, listening to the game on the radio. When we heard the game was tied in the seventh inning, we both looked at each other, realized the Phillies opened up the vet around the eighth inning, and instantly decided to drive to catch the end of the game. The game went around 14 innings before Dale Murphy finally won it for the Phils, which meant we had six innings of free baseball from the 200 section behind first base. And while John Crock may not be happy I remember this, I saw him when he was first traded to the Phils playing left field. He caught a fly ball for the second out of the inning, but had lost count. He began to trot towards the infield as the runner on second realized Crook's mistake and dashed in to score a run before Crook could get the ball to home plate. In 1993, while I was attending graduate school in Washington, D.C., I begged one of my professors to allow me to take the exam early or late because my grandfather had gotten tickets to Game 5 of the World Series. My professor relented, and as a result, I witnessed one of the most incredible games that had ever been played in that explosive series, as Kurt Schilling threw a complete game, one nothing shutout, in the face of possible elimination by the Blue Jays. Veterans Stadium hosted the All-Star Game twice. In 1976, while celebrating the country's bicentennial, five Phillies made it to the Midsummer Classic, Schmidt, Lezinski, Boone, Boa, and Cash. In 1996, relief pitcher Ricky Patalico was the lone Phillies representative, but I was in attendance to witness the incredible performance by Norristown native Mike Piazza. 
The Phillies threw two no-hitters at the vet. The first was by Terry Mulholland, who beat the San Francisco Giants 6-1 on August 5, 1990. The second, again coming against the Giants, was thrown by Kevin Millwood on April 27, 2003. I remember when they changed the seats from the beautiful multicolor arrangement to the drab all-blue setup. I remember when the Phillies wore all-blue hats, which clashed with their red pinstripes for home day games. I remember the hideous all-red Saturday Night Special uniforms from 1979, which were retired after one game after the Expos drubbed the Phils 10-5. Inexplicably, the Phillies brought those horrible uniforms back for one game, which was picture day, 40 years later, which dissuaded me from attending that game. The result was similar, a loss in pathetic fashion, this time to the Braves, 15-7. By 2003, the good times at Veterans Stadium had run their course. In fact, the vet probably stayed around longer than it should have. The AstroTurf deteriorated to became dangerous, particularly for football players. A nationally televised Army-Navy game saw a fence give way, sending a number of cadets plummeting to the field, injuring nine. The stadium was imploded on March 21, 2004, with the help of the Fanatic and Greg Lazinski to make room for a parking lot next to the new Citizens Bank Park. Bronze markers show where home plate and the pitching mound used to stand. It took only four years for the new stadium to host a second world championship. And while CBP is a beautiful state-of-the-art facility, the vet, with all the time I spent there as a child and a young adult, will continue to have a warm place in my heart. Thank you for watching. If you like videos like this, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. Show your Philadelphia pride by visiting our merch store. The link is in the description below. If you like videos like this, please consider subscribing to our channel and click on the bell symbol to be notified whenever we release a video like this in the future. Thank you.